Well, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to our afternoon. My name is Paul Miller, and I'm the Associate Director of the Clements Center for National Security. Our mission is to help train the next generation of national security leaders. Uh, in service of that mission, this year we've hosted a series of speakers on Afghanistan. And I want to mention briefly who's come before the speaker series, because many of them are still on our website. You can view their talks uh, on our website, and we're able to record most of them. Uh, so in the fall, we hosted Dr. Thomas Barfield of Boston University. We hosted Steve Cole of Columbia University, the author of Ghost Wars. Uh, this spring, we had uh, Dr. Rob Rakoff, who talked on uh, the U.S. Afghan relationship before 9-11. Uh, and uh, then just last week, we had on campus Jeff Eggers, who served uh, in the Obama administration as the point man on Afghanistan and Pakistan for five years. Uh, why Afghanistan? There's no one better to cap off this speaker series than our guest today, Ambassador Sayed Jawad. Uh, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. Uh, but you may be wondering, why focus on Afghanistan this year? It seems that uh, Americans' attention is focused primarily this year on two things, on the Islamic State and Donald Trump. Uh, Afghanistan has not been in the headlines. Uh, it doesn't seem to garner the kind of attention that many of the other things in the world are getting. It's worth looking uh, at Afghanistan, and it's, the, the university is the right place to do it, because we're not headline driven. Uh, this is precisely the place where we can and should take a deeper look at things that are truly important, uh, even if they're not receiving the attention in the headlines. Uh, the uh, war in Afghanistan is almost, almost, the longest continuous military operation in history. For you historians out there, you'll know that the conflict in the Philippines and the occupation of Haiti still technically lasted longer, but just give it a few years, and then we can finally call it America's longest war. Uh, this uh, long military uh, operation will have a profound effect on American attitudes towards the use of force for a generation. It will have an impact on the fate of democracy across the Muslim world. It will have an impact on uh, South Asia, which is home to a third of the human population, a uh, home to two nuclear powers, and a home to the densest network of jihadist groups in the world, actually in South Asia, not in the Middle East. And so the war in Afghanistan will have a profound impact on uh, the stability of this entire region. <coughs> and finally, it will have an effect on American relations with NATO, this was NATO's first military operation, uh, with Russia and with Iran. This is a strategically important region of the world, and how this uh, war ends have a huge impact on American relations across the region. And of course, there's humanitarian considerations as well. We've watched with concern as the situation in Syria has deteriorated over five years. Uh, and unfortunately, it is still true that something very similar may play out in Afghanistan and indeed in Pakistan as well. So this issue of Afghanistan and its future remains important. It remains something worthy of our attention as scholars, uh, as some of us as for, uh, former policymakers or as future policymakers. And so today, we brought to campus Ambassador Syed Jawad to bring us the Afghan perspective on America's longest war. Uh, he has been practiced at bringing the Afghan perspective to American audiences uh, in his capacity as the ambassador from Afghanistan to the United States, a position he held from 2003 to 2007. <coughs> ambassador Jawad was born in Kandahar, he attended a French school in Afghanistan before studying at Kabul University, uh, briefly, until the Soviet occupation, where he then was able to study law in Germany, uh, and then moved to San Francisco, where he earned his MBA at Golden Gate University. He lived in San Francisco and New York for about nine years. After the fall of the Taliban regime, he returned to Afghanistan. He served as President Karzai's chief of staff for a couple of years before his appointment as ambassador. Uh, he is still involved in the Afghan government, he serves right now as the political and military advisor to Chief Executive Abdullah. He's also the CEO of Capitalize, a strategic consulting firm, and the director of the Foundation for Afghanistan. Please join me in welcoming our guest speaker today. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure. It's an honor being here. Thank you very much for your interest uh, being for Soviet University. I am very grateful for this opportunity and uh, I'm looking forward to discuss uh, a number of issues related to Afghanistan with you. Uh, 
uh, I'll try to kind of set the stage on some major issues uh, happening in Afghanistan right now, and we'll be more than happy to discuss in more detail some of the subjects that are of more interest to you. I will talk about the security situation, uh, the role of the Taliban and the, uh, the Islamic State, uh, which is commonly referred to as Daesh in Afghanistan, the Arabic uh, name for, for uh, Islamic State or ISIS. Uh, talk uh, briefly about governance, uh, the social changes that are taking place in Afghanistan. I purposefully actually chose a picture that, that is from a street artist and a, a young uh, woman in Afghanistan that is becoming a normal street artist now. And his work is, is very, very interesting and I think that is a symbolic of the many changes that are taking place in Afghanistan. Women being able to express their ideas on the walls of a almost destroyed city, that's a good example of what's happening socially in Afghanistan. Some of the economic challenges and opportunities, and uh, uh, we'll talk briefly about Pakistan, Iran, China, United States, and NATO, our ally, and, if, and we'll try to figure out the way forward if time uh, is available. But again, the idea is to kind of set the stage and then I'll discuss it in more detail with you. Uh, on the security situation, um, as you probably uh, hear it in the news, probably less because the news of Afghanistan are now kind of secondary, but usually in the winter in Afghanistan, the, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a slowdown in the pace of the war. This year we did not experience that. The, the violence uh, continued, but so was the ability of the Afghan security forces. They, they, they are fighting very great, uh, bravely. The Afghans are, are very proud of their national security forces. But they're also suffering in a number that on the long term would be very difficult to sustain. Uh, and just in, in uh, last year, uh, over 7,000 Afghan uh, soldiers have died. And the average casualty <coughs> now is over 15 uh, Afghan National Security Forces, combined AAAAP Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police. More than 15 of them are, are dying per day. The uh, United States has given Afghanistan a well-trained army, but a lot of the enablers that were provided by the NATO and, all, uh, and, and U.S. troops, they are not there anymore. And that's one reason that the number of the Afghan security forces that are giving their life is a lot more significant. Uh, the nature, I, I know some of I've received some friends in here who have served in Afghanistan, and I, I just want to make sure that indicate that the people of Afghanistan are very grateful services of those who have served in Afghanistan, especially those in the military. The nature of that, of that the mission has changed uh, from what used to be called uh, ISAF. Uh, now we are in resolution support, and that mission is more limited into training uh, and enabling the Afghans to carry out the fight more effectively themselves. But if you look at the background of the, of, the, of the transition of the security into the Afghan forces, that process of transitioning the war to, to Afghan forces were ill-planned. Uh, and it was more politically driven, both by the political leadership in Afghanistan back then, President Karzai, and also the, the leadership in Washington. There was a promise of ending the war, and that promise was regardless of the reality on the ground. So, that, that, that push for, for, for transition has some consequences right now, especially in the term of the deteriorating security situation in Afghanistan. And we are honestly, when we look at the capabilities of the Afghan security forces, they are not fully ready yet. So, again, the enablers, particularly in terms of, of, of uh, medivac, uh, air force support, and, and many other enablers, uh, uh, ISR and others, are not fully in place. Uh, for the Afghans to be able to carry that for uh, that war effectively and independently. <coughs> in addition to that, uh, there is a strong push for uh, peace negotiation and reconciliation uh, by um, our political leadership, but also for by the United States and our NATO ally, which undermine actually the morale and the mission, and the military mission in Afghanistan, because. Uh, the political leadership of Afghanistan is calling Taliban their, their brothers or their, uh, uh, then it creates, it impacts the morale of the Afghan security forces who would like to carry this 
war in a black and white way of this, this is the enemy and this is the friend. So, and, and that push uh, has created actually some degree of, of, of morale issue in, among Afghan security forces. The enemy is not very clearly defined in Afghanistan anymore. Um, Taliban, based on international criteria by U.S. and other forces, are no longer terrorists. Uh, they are not on the list of the terrorists. And, and, and internally, also in Afghanistan, uh, different terminologies are being used for, for Taliban. Um, so there is issue of, of morale in, 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 in a mission that is not very clearly defined. And uh, the question for many soldiers who are dying in Afghanistan, it is like, who are we fighting against and what we are fighting for? Uh, the, 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 the new phenomenon in the uh, security scene is, of course, the emergence of ISIS or IS or Daesh, or whatever you call it, the Islamic State. Uh, the, uh, the fighters of the Islamic State in Afghanistan are active. You probably hear more of them in, in Syria and Iraq and other places. But uh, they are well funded. Uh, they are paid almost three times more than the Taliban fighters. Usually, a Taliban fighter gets paid something between three to three hundred fifty dollar a month. But the, uh, the IS and Daesh is paying close to a thousand dollar, and they're using a lot more effective ways of, of recruiting uh, and expanding. Uh, and uh, both uh, bases in and around Afghanistan, especially in Pakistan. And since the ideology of the Taliban has very limited attraction to the Afghan people because the Taliban are known, um, they were a government in Afghanistan at one point, uh, IS is, is more effective in using actually new technology to, to recruit. In addition to these two factors that affect the security, criminality also is another issue for the Afghans, which is mostly driven by, by poverty and, 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 and limited economic opportunity that are being further diminished in Afghanistan because of the uh, departure of the security, international security forces. So now that we have this three factors that is undermining security in Afghanistan, Taliban, IS, and, and criminality, how to deal with this? What is the best way to approach? Of course, it is a complicated uh, issue to require a more detailed discussion, but in a kind of natural uh, I think as far as Taliban is concerned, the military pressure should continue on them to degrade the Taliban further, but yet the door to negotiation should be open. That there's, each war must end uh, finally through uh, reconciliation and peace negotiation. But as far as IS and Islamic State is, is involved, I think <coughs> there's no negotiation, there's no middle ground to compromise with them, like they want to behead and you say, no, don't behead, just cut their hands. So when there's, there's no way of, of, of finding a middle ground. It's, it has to be fought, actually. Effectively, it has to be eliminated. These are a serious danger to, to Afghanistan, to the region, and to the world. There's, 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 there, it would be hard to imagine that, that we can uh, find a compromise. I think the reason that they are becoming stronger in the, in the Middle East and the region is that they are, they are being used by certain powers in, 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 in that part of the world and are seen as, as, as more useful than others. And they have effectively capitalized on that to acquire funding from countries in the Middle East particularly. Uh, the continued partnership with NATO and the U.S. is key for Afghanistan. We, uh, as I mentioned in the past, we actively Afghan have asked this, and I think uh, continued uh, U.S. presence in a way that will enable the Afghan to carry the war themselves more effectively would be necessary to, to have a stable and peaceful Afghanistan. Uh, an important issue uh, in, in our regional context is that uh, uh, some of our neighbors have complicated relations with Afghanistan and with the U.S. and, and, and other. But still, uh, one of the important players in Afghan security is Pakistan uh, and the uh, United States and China both is our neighbor. Uh, could do more to 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 discourage Pakistan to continue to provide safe havens for terrorist groups and also uh, undermine the security in, uh, in Afghanistan. And that leverages both in terms of economic and diplomatic pressure. Because uh, uh, from our experience, we know if terrorists 
always the terrorist groups need a basis and, 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 and without having providing a financial uh, military and ideological support it would be hard for these groups particularly groups such as Taliban that has really no not so much of, of ideological attraction to survive if that sanctuaries and that support is does not exist for them in the neighborhood um, and again as I mentioned extremism is still being used as a Tool of, of, of policy, is a tool of foreign policy, both in terms of providing support to Taliban, but also to other extremist groups such as IS and Daesh, and that is a short-sighted policy, as we have seen it in the case of Al Qaeda. That at some point, the Saudis and others were funding it them and hoping that they would carry their war and fight somewhere else, but they changed their mind and their position, and they turned around and, and, and caused actually problem and trouble for many of those countries who were originally funding them. Um, but our approach uh, to deal with Taliban would hardly succeed unless there is a unified approach, a unified regional approach against the IS, which is a threat. Uh, many countries in the region, especially in our neighborhoods, are seeing them as a serious threat <coughs> from the United States to China, our neighbor, Russia, Iran, and, and others. They, they still consider IS of, of no use. Uh, but a source of threat. There are a few countries that are still actually looking the other way or supporting IS, but Taliban are getting mainly their support uh, from Pakistan. <coughs> Another issue that is coming up in many of our discussions lately is, is the effectiveness of, of Islamic State to recruit uh, young people all over the world, and particularly in the Middle East, but not only, even, even European countries. Why are they able to, to, to do this? What's happening? They're using, actually, they're weaponizing information. And, 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 and they, are, they are using digital extremism and, 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 and digital media and new media in a very effective way. Uh, the basis that they're using it, I think, personally, is, is the same as what attracts a lot of young people, even, even children, is, is basically violence that is used in, in video games, as you can see, and sex. So they're, they're basically using two uh, important recruitment tools of violence and sex to turn actually many young people into killers, uh, dangerous elements as we can see in Europe and in the Middle East. We hear a lot more about the <coughs> phenomenal terrorist attacks in Europe. We don't hear about it in Kabul or in, or in Baghdad and other places. That this happened in much bigger magnitude in these countries, in these cities. Uh, and, and it's carried out by pretty much by the same group and same element. So to, to fight digital extremism in the media, again, this is a technology invented by us, by you, and it's being taken over by them. So we have to be able to find ways of fighting with more effective. And something that I noticed actually that was controlled and fought relatively effectively was child pornography in the US and the Western countries because everybody put their, their, their mind and their pressure on that. So this is wrong, it has to stop. We should fight digital extremism with the same type of determination and vigor. And, and do not allow it, to, do not look at the other way. It does not make excuses based on, 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 on access to, to uh, information or other things. This is, this is a serious fight. People are getting killed. Communities are being destroyed. And there is no reason to fight it. Well, they have to have this access to the information and we cannot do much about it. This is my personal opinion. Again, that's, that's what's needed. In addition to that, no peace and reconciliation will succeed if one party thinks that they can win it by military means. Like, why should, why should I reconcile if I can, I can, I can, I can take over and win? So, for, for the peace and reconciliation to succeed, you always have to keep the military pressure on. It's not, reconciliation is not a substitute for, for military. It's just a continuation of that. Afghan wants peace, but at the same time, you want a peace that is meaningful for our, us, for our family, that we can retain actually the gains that has come to us mostly through your money, through your assistance in education and health and governance and freedom and women's rights and many other. And these changes have drastic, these issues have changed in Afghanistan drastically. Like the way Afghans are educated, and if there's time I can talk about it more, in the access to information, freedom of the media, is phenomenal in a country like Afghanistan in the past 10, 15 years. This is, there has been tremendous change. And those changes must be somehow maintained and not be sacrificed for the sake of, of a quick peace and reconciliation with Taliban. 
and never actually you can uh, have peace or, or negotiate from the position of weakness. So the military power continued to be to be built. And again, the war does not have to be carried by, by Americans. We are very grateful for the sacrifice of the life that you have done. It was significant. It was very significant. This, this war could and should be carried by the Afghans. But we need your assistance to enable us to continue this war, to, to finish this and sustain actually some of the gain that we have maintained. On the, the diplomatic front, uh, Again, since the beginning, especially since the new government was established and President Ghani made a point of reaching out to the regional leader, particularly China, Pakistan, India, and many other countries in the region. So he put a lot of political capital in this process because even in Afghanistan, there are groups that says that there, there's no use, like why you're doing that, you're not going to get any result. But he put a lot of political capital in this process. There has been, there was a lot of enthusiasm that these outreach will, will, will reach some kind of conclusion. And there is more realism now. We are understanding that it's not going to change. This is a long process, and, and, and it is not going to uh, happen overnight. There's a significant number of bilateral Afghanistan, Pakistan, trilateral Afghanistan, Pakistan in the United States, and now even uh, quadrilateral that include China to try to to help uh, Afghan government and the Taliban to find a peaceful solution, but with very limited uh, progress. On that, I'll talk about that a little bit if there is time about the role that China, Iran, and other are playing. Governance, you, those of you who follow Afghan uh, situation and development are familiar with the with the challenges that we are still facing with the governance in Afghanistan. <coughs> what we are facing is is, is bad governance in, in the term of continued corruption in the government institution. This fight has not been successful so far. Uh, unfortunately, the national unity government that was established about a year and a half ago is, has still have serious challenges of making actually a critical presence first. Because it is a coalition government, it's a, it's a weak government, and it takes way too long for the appointments to be completed. So the issue of, of bad governance is there, but in addition to the bad governance, you have limited governance. There's absence of resources for that government institution to deliver services which has to do with the weak economy of Afghanistan and uh, um, uh, limited human capital to deliver the services. And no governance in the areas that are insecure, the areas that are overrun by Taliban, the areas that are contested by, by Taliban, there is uh, almost a complete absence of government. The National Unity Government is a work in progress. It's been uh, still working to, to, to form actually uh, a number of the, of the positions in the government are not fully filled in, in the term that was sorted out with, uh, by Secretary Kerry. It was two years. That two years is coming to an end in about five months. So we will have to see what, what kind of arrangement after that will be sorted out. Uh, it, as I mentioned, uh, things are, are not moving as fast as it should. There is a great degree of frustration uh, among our friends and allies in the U.S. and NATO countries that uh, the, the governance uh, issue in Afghanistan still remain a challenging issue. And uh, well, while, while we talk about all the challenges and issues and difficulties in Afghanistan, we should not actually lose the focus that Afghanistan in the past uh, 12, 13 years have drastically changed. Uh, the country has, has completely changed both in terms of, of access to education. I was just this morning, uh, the Afghan government announced the results of a, of a national um, uh, exam that allowed Afghan students to go to the state-run universities. In 2002, uh, the total number of the students going to universities in Afghanistan was 4,000. What the Taliban called from was 4,000. Today, they posted the results of this exam online for the students. 86,000 students have been admitted just to the government-run universities. Probably double of these numbers are going to private universities. So about probably 300,000 students are going to different universities just this year. This is a big change. And, and it's, it's changed both in terms of the numbers but also of the quality of the education. Kabul University, many other <coughs> private universities are establishing themselves as an example of very good universities. And 
again, with, with your support, with your assistance, uh, significant assistance, an American University of Afghanistan is established. It's a very small university, but it's doing a magnificent job of, of training the future Afghan leaders. That university is modeled Afghan after the American University of Beirut, which was an important institution for producing many leaders at that part of the world. The university is, 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 is so, it's been so successful that I hear from the students that they've convinced their parents to come back from, from, <coughs> from exile and refugee in neighboring countries in order for, this, for the kids to be able to go to American University of Afghanistan. So that's, uh, in, like this, there's the, the, the access to the media is, is, is incredible. We, we, we have over 76 TV stations, many TV and radio stations owned and run and, and, and broadcasting for women only. Uh, number of newspapers. One of the few countries in the region that, that impose no censorship any type of censorship on the internet or, or others, access to information is completely free and it's becoming also more affordable. One important investment that the Afghan government made while building, while building the, 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 the ring road in Afghanistan is that they laid actually the fiber optics alongside. So the country is, is connected to fiber optics, it's, which enable actually people to buy internet in a more affordable price. Women's rights and in many areas are becoming institutionalized. Art and culture and histories are making a big comeback uh, to Afghanistan. And in uh, uh, women's life, not only actually are prisons from any post on military, we have, we have Afghan Special Forces actually, a woman serving the Afghan Special Forces, which is a, a drastic change for a, for, a, for a very conservative country as the Taliban, where everyone was confined at home. And significant number of, of Afghan uh, women are undergoing uh, for training, even advanced police training to Turkey and other countries. So the security forces are attracting a lot of Afghan women, which is very promising for the future of the country. Basically, significant improvement is taking place in the past 10, 15 years in infrastructure, uh, in telecommunications. Almost uh, every Afghan has a telephone right now, a cell phone. You travel in, in remote areas. As soon as you land and nowhere in the mountain, first thing you notice that your BlackBerry start or your iPhone start getting your emails, which is which was a big deal. It is. It is. When I was chief of staff of President Karzai in 2002, there was two flights out of Kabul a week, and the only way of getting uh, packages out of Kabul was through those flights. And we had like I had asked the airline to not to leave, but for checking with the office of the prison because if you had packages to send out, you had to hand deliver it to the pilot or someone so you can get it to Dubai and then mail it for them or send it or FedEx it. So that from this to the degree that almost every villager in Afghanistan has access to the information, uh, uh, it, it's an incredible change. And that's, this will be very important <coughs> towards this, this, those uh, accomplishments. And, um, but how, however, what has to be realistic? The fact that the U.S. and, and, and international uh, forces have left Afghanistan, a lot of job and opportunities that were related to supporting U.S. military or NATO military has been reduced drastically. So the level of unemployment in Afghanistan is about 52%, extremely, extremely high. That's why you see a big push of many educated Afghans, unfortunately, leaving as refugees to Europe. This is a big loss for our country because these are some of the best Afghans that have been educated and produced in the past 10-15 years and the fact that they are becoming refugees in Europe it's, it's, a, it's a huge loss for, for Afghanistan. Um, an economic opportunity, I don't want to take up too much time in, but usually uh, I just want to briefly mention that there is tremendous opportunity because of the location of Afghanistan both in terms of, of uh, mining and minerals but also connecting producing and connecting actually the region through energy resources in the country, both in terms of pipeline, um, electricity, there's a number of the projects that's going on. I, I will, if there's interest, I can discuss it in more details, but I'll, I'll skip about that. Just going back to, to the regional diplomacy, I know being uh, in the university, that's more of, of interest. Um, and as I mentioned, our relation with Pakistan is, is, is complicated. We have not been able, both Afghanistan and our international partner, to convince Pakistan to play a constructive role in Afghanistan. Um, 
what Pakistan is, is, is seeking in Afghanistan is, is really a weak Afghanistan. They, that's historically, they, they think that a stronger Afghanistan will be a friend of India, and therefore we, together with India, will encircle Pakistan. Again, that's, that's, it's not what every Pakistani thinks, but that's what Pakistan military thinks. Uh, and, and for them, those of you who have traveled in Afghanistan, the Pakistani military live in a totally different standard of living than normal Pakistanis. They, even if in the small cities, remote places like Quetta, you go to a, what is called the military controlment, the officers are drinking whiskey, they are playing uh, polo or golf, and then the kids are going to school in, in London, and then you get out of there military barracks and it's a, it's a sheep board. Yeah, there's no schools, if there's any, there's only madrasas. Those kids are going and being brainwashed in, in the madrasas. So, and um, Pakistan is seeking a political and geographical space for Taliban in Afghanistan. Political space is the more complicated part of the equation. Uh, they become part of the government because it is hard, honestly, for the, for the Taliban to compete in a democratic process. Because uh, what they're doing in Pakistan either, Pakistan they're well funded and, and more successful, but still, when they run for, <coughs> for parliament or, 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 or local uh, elections, they, they are between 4 to 7 percent when they, if they do very well, even less. Uh, so they will join the government on their own term. So they will join the government provided that they bring, bring in Sharia items that will enable them to have more power in the government. So it's not going to be through a democratic uh, process that you'll participate in. And, they, and Pakistan interest is also to undermine India and Afghanistan. That's, that's part of the strategic uh, view of, of, of Afghanistan. But as you can see on the, put on the map, so you can see uh, how we have a very long border with Pakistan. We don't have border with India, of course. China, we have a small border of about 80 kilometers, but it's a difficult area, so it's not, not traveled a lot. Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, these countries are important northern neighbors, but um, and we could do a lot more with it. There's better infrastructure in place that started during the Soviets, better bridges, better roads. But those countries are closed for commerce because of the political nature of the regime. It's, it's very difficult actually to do business with Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan. Tajikistan is a little bit better. So we are, as you can see, we are, we are in a tough neighborhood. So, and, and again, if you don't get to, you get to choose your friend, but not your neighbor. That's, that's, that's <laughs> Iran, um, uh, an, an important uh, neighbor for Afghanistan and uh, an important uh, player. There has been in the past. Um, we can discuss this in more detail. We, uh, Iran has been from the beginning actually when the uh, United States uh, came to Afghanistan and a political uh, conference took place in Bonn in 2002. They were their role was constructed. And, and our demand in the past from Iran and the United States was that to leave their differences out of Afghanistan, because we cannot afford the two of them to also uh, complicate uh, the more situation more in Afghanistan. And we were to a certain degree successful. The Iranians were a relatively good neighbor. They still um, occasionally, or they keep their ties with Taliban, they provide weapons to Taliban occasionally. That's, uh, again, because they think they see Taliban as an anti-America, anti-US force. Not, not so much against us, because at the same time they know that the Taliban nationally being Sunni and having tie with other extremists in Pakistan, they are they're not that friendly with Iran, but they keep that relations. Now with the improved, um, the prospects of improved relation with, with the United States, that's hopeful because at least as you can see, our only access to the Indian Ocean at the bottom is either through Pakistan or Iran. So there is more infrastructure being built by, by Iran to enable us access actually the Indian Ocean uh, through through Iran but this is going to be a long-term process again uh, a lot of countries a lot of companies are still uh, not willing to go to Iran because the sanctions are still fully in place in Iran um, but there are a deep uh, linguistic tie with Iran we speak the same language Afghanistan Tajikistan and Iran speak the same language uh, for sea but we also speak Pashto which is spoken uh, also in, in a big part of, of Pakistan. There are other languages also spoken in Afghanistan. Um, on China, again, a very important neighbor and uh, um, uh, it, uh, it is becoming more engaged and involved in Afghanistan uh, with, with the US and NATO uh, 
gradual uh, withdrawal, but they could do a lot more. They, they should do a lot more. I think they were hoping that, that NATO and U.S. Uh, will kind of uh, create a condition for the Chinese to to come in and do business, and that's, they know that's not going to happen. They have to. My personal opinion is they have to take more responsibility for the regional security. They are disengaged so far uh, in Afghanistan, and uh, the, the reason for their disengagement is that there are certain threat to China, which is extremism, and, and certain extremist group operating in, in eastern China, close to Pakistan, Afghanistan border. But that's not a big concern of them right now. Uh, and since they have much better relations with Pakistan, so they are in a difficult position to take sides is, a, is, a, is an unbiased uh, trend. But more and more, we are reaching out to them. We are hoping that they will play a more constructive role. But so far, they are they are disengaged relatively. On the United States, as you know, the first thing that the new government was, was established, the national unity government, uh, we signed the, 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 the strategic partnership agreement and, and, the, and the bilateral security agreement was uh, also signed. So that, um, uh, <coughs> but still, uh, honestly, after one and a half year of the strategic partnership agreement being signed, there is mutual frustration on both sides uh, in Afghanistan and the United States. In Afghanistan, because I can expect that the U.S. would do more in terms of putting pressure on Pakistan and providing actually better enabler to the Afghan security forces. In the United States, the frustration is mainly driven by the fact that uh, there are still challenges, serious challenges with the governments in Afghanistan. Um, NATO has reduced their, their military presence to almost uh, zero. There is possibility if there is a revision of the United States willing to, to keep more troops, uh, money. Some of the European, uh, some of the NATO countries like Germany and others are indicating interest to keep their presence in certain provinces, uh, Germans or in the north, and, and, and particularly in Mazar Sharif in this area. Um, <coughs> so the way forward, uh, Unfortunately, because of the elections here in the United States, I personally do not think that there will be a major shift in the U.S. policy. While we are going through a really difficult time in Afghanistan. Um, but as far as Afghans are concerned, the Afghan people primary, also the Afghan government, the new government of national unity, they do demand U.S. continued U.S. presence in Afghanistan. Um, peace and reconciliation, I think my recommendation to our friends here in the U.S. and, and, and is to be realistic about it, there is, there is not going to be a breakthrough overnight. There's going to be a process, it's going to take time, and it will succeed only if, if the military pressure continues. Um, ICE is, 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 a, is a threat, and, 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 but again, they don't have much root in countries like Afghanistan because their ideology is, is foreign. So there's the opportunity of containing them is, is, is quick. We are, this containment should be in the term of mobilizing the communities, uh, but also more blunt uh, military operation and, <coughs> and reducing the, 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 the access to the digital media for recruitment, or, or at least overseeing it and knowing what's going on and how they're recruiting that. That will be just a general uh, information. We'll have to discuss any issues in more detail, but I'm, I'm really grateful for your interest. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if there were just too many issues covered, but there's so many things going on in the country. And uh, speaking for an audience that it includes actually members from the community, professors, former military, it's to find the right balance is challenging. But I'm happy to answer any question on, on any of these issues.